to introduce our two candidates for state representative to the Ellerford from our area, Bill Cole and Greg Vitale. Greg Vitale is our current representative serving a 10th term. Bill Toll III, William Toll III, is currently a prosecutor in the Delaware County's District Attorney's Office. Please make sure you've turned off cell phones and pagers for now until the forum is over. The forum will be run in accordance with League of Women Voters format. We will begin with five-minute statements by each candidate, followed by questions submitted by you people in the audience. You will see people going up and down the aisles with cards and pencils for you to write and submit your questions. Please make sure your questions are appropriate to the state legislature and not national issues such as Social Security and Medicare, which they can't do anything about. Those are not voted on in Harrisburg. You may direct your questions to one candidate or to both candidates. If it's in intended for one individual candidate, the other candidate will have the same amount of time, which is two minutes, to respond. So each question, each candidate has up to two minutes to respond to each question. Then the candidates will have five minutes for closing statements at the end. We're going to try to end by 8.40, 8.30, 8.40 tonight in order for people to return home in time to see the last presidential candidates forum on TV. And I hope you think that ours is run better than that one. <laughs> our moderators tonight come from our community. I'd like to introduce Kevin Kelly, a local businessman, of the Civic Councils, and Chris Whiting, President of the Civic Council. They will collect the written questions and read them one by one to the candidates. They will not choose a question that has already been asked, but otherwise will read what you have written. We ask that everyone in the audience please be respectful of our moderators and candidates, and that you refrain from applause and verbal comments until the very end after the second closing statement we may have applause. I'd like to remind everyone here and watching at, watching at home that election day is Tuesday, November 6th, and that voters do not need a photo ID for this election. The court system is much easier. The courts decided not to enforce this new law at this time. However, if you are a new voter, never voted before, or if you change precincts, and this will be the first time in your new precinct, you do have to have a photo ID. Um, our League of Women Voters Nonpartisan Voters Guide will be out on um, Wednesday's News of Delaware County. Um, if you purchase the paper, you'll get an insert that is nonpartisan and explains that stands from all the candidates. Polls will be open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. In case of a large turnout, you must be in line by 8 p.m. to vote, but you will get your turn. This forum will be broadcast on local cable channels in Haverford Township. Now we'll begin with opening statements. Greg Vitale won the coin toss and will go first. Thank you. I'd like to thank the League for hosting this and uh, thank the audience for being here and showing their interest in uh, government and uh, those watching at home who are interested enough to uh, become informed voters. Um, I have been very proud to serve this district for the last 20 years and uh, feel I have done my best to be an effective advocate for issues that are important to all of us. Uh, the first issue I was going to talk about was, was my commitment to public education and all of the, uh, the work I had done in the various issues I had planned to do on public education. And that, well, that's why it particularly saddened me to be handed a piece of literature uh, just moments before that contained incredible distortions about my record on public education. I just witnessed an exchange between Larry Feinberg, perhaps the most respected voice in public education in this district, taking uh, Bill Toll to task for the distortion of this my education record. This claims that I have uh, voted against education funding. 
when just the opposite is true. But that's just not the first piece. His, his literature before that, again, distorts my votes on public education. It just really saddens me that politics has sunk to this level. I think we need to take responsibility for those who send campaign literature out on our behalf. And to have to deal with a campaign like this is truly disappointing. People who know me, people who know my record, know how important public education is to me. They know when that 2011 to 2012 budget came out and Governor Corbett cut $900 million to education, how hard I fought against that. And to suggest otherwise, to suggest I get an F in education, is just shameful. People also know that when Act 1 was attempted to be passed putting referendum requirements on the raising of revenues uh, for local school districts, things, something that would dumb down the quality of Haverford and Radnor and Marple school districts, how hard I fought against Act 1 and those requirements. Uh, I've worked with school district officials on trying to correct the, correct the draining of the funding from our schools to cyber schools. Cyber schools are good ideas, but they take money disproportionately from the brick and mortar traditional schools. And I've worked with this school district to stop, stop the inequity in the way they are funded. I've also, also tried to stop um, the inequity in charter schools and how, again, they pull money from brick and mortar schools. I worked with Larry Feinberg. Uh, sometimes I'm in communication with him on the floor debate, most recently trying to defeat the Killing Amendment that would take local control from charter schools. Education is extremely important to me. I get the fact that it's the most important issue in this district. And if re-elected, I will fight. I will fight to get that money back in this budget. I am a friend public education. Please don't believe this campaign literature. Other issues of importance to me, transportation funding. We have almost 5,000 bridges that uh, have been deemed by PennDOT engineers as unsatisfactory. We need to do something to, to pay for the repair of these. Now, the governor's own commission has recommended a, a, a oil franchise tax, lifting the cap on that tax to fund these roads and bridges. I have stated publicly, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, that I would support such a tax. Uh, the governor and those who are tied to the No Tax Pledge of Rover Northwest don't do the right thing when they neglect important things like our, our roads and bridges. Open and accountable government. I've been a long been a proponent of open and accountable government. I have introduced legislation on campaign, campaign finance reform. And it's disgusting when I see what the influence money has on politics. In, in the 15 seconds I have left, I'll also express my interest in the environment and how I'll continue to work on Marcellus Shale and promote alternative uh, energy. I think we need to increase our alternative energy portfolio standard to 20% by 2026, and I'll continue to push the four bills I have introduced to try to make more cellist drilling uh, safer. Thank you. I want to thank the Lee and Women voters for hosting this evening's event, Mr. Vitale, the folks here who are chosen to attend, as well as the folks watching from home. I'm running for state representatives. Our district needs someone whose votes in Harrisburg will actually reflect the views of our community. Over the course of this year, I've been to nearly 20,000 homes. I've heard people's concerns about such things as, as taxes, such things as funding, public education, things about concerning, like, transportation and infrastructure. People are also concerned about gridlock. They want to hear, how are you going to get something done? What are you going to do to try to prevent the gridlock that we face in, in all our different levels of government? You have to be able to compromise. You have to be able to cooperate with people. As a state representative, I will work hard to 
make sure that the public school and public education is well funded. I work hard to make sure that our transportation system and our public infrastructure is, is well funded and maintained so that people want to come to live and work here. These are the things that are important to people, jobs, taxes, education, recreation. My opponent, Mr. Vitale, has been in office for 20 years. At this point, he is a career politician. When you see a vote that's 200 to 1, or 190-something to 3 or 4, it's almost always Mr. Vitale who's either that one or one of those three or four or some small minority of, of individuals voting against bills that have overwhelming bipartisan support. When I say 200 to 1, I'm not kidding. When I say overwhelming bipartisan support, I'm not kidding. That means all the Republicans and all the Democrats. Let's face it, there's only 203 members of the legislature, and when 200 of them voting one way and one is voting the other way, that is overwhelming bipartisan support. And these are bills that our community supports as well. The job of the state representative is not to vote, it's not to vote with the crowd in Harrisburg, but it's not to vote against the crowd in Harrisburg. It's to vote the way that your community would have you vote if they had the opportunity to do so. The other part of the job, Mr. Vitale hasn't, I will. The other part of the job is just getting stuff done. Let's face it, in 20 years, Mr. Vitale has introduced a handful of legislation, and in 20 years, he's gotten two bills passed. Two. Most bills he introduced, it doesn't matter if it's a good idea or a bad idea. If he can't get the support he needs to get something done, then he's just ineffective. Whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, you have to be able to work with people in order to get something done. The only way to get anything done in my house, I'm going to guess in all your houses, and certainly in the state house, you have to be able to cooperate, work with people, deal with people who don't necessarily start out sharing your point of view. In my line of business as a prosecutor in media, it's what I do all the time. Who am I dealing with as a prosecutor? I'm dealing with defendants, defense lawyers, judges, cops, victims, witnesses, people who are in court because there's a dispute. They don't agree with something. Most cases don't go to trial. Most cases get worked out. Most cases get resolved. They come to a proper, equitable, just resolution. But it doesn't just happen. It's the negotiation. It's the discussion. It's the give and take. It's the compromise. It's the ability to work with people. And that's what I do. And that's what Mr. Vitale's record shows that he hasn't been able to do. Even on things that he thinks are important, and I'm not saying they're not important, but I'm saying the things that he values most in terms of his career, he hasn't been able to accomplish anything legislating as a legislator in 20 years. Now, when I go out knocking on doors in the afternoon or in the evening, who am I going with? Well, I'm going with people, usually it's a group of people, but half the time, if not more, I'm going with criminal defense lawyers. I'm going with people who I work against during the day, and they're coming out with me to work with me in the afternoon. That should tell you something. I'm able to have a professional adversarial position and role with people in my, in my job and yet still have their support and gain their trust and their willingness to not, to not just support me but to come out and knock on doors with me. That tells you something about my ability to get along with people, to work with people, and to foster those kinds of relationships that get things done. In 20 years, Mr. Vitale has introduced 20-some bills and two of them have passed. Both of them were 1993, and one of them had to do with the observation in Pennsylvania of Earth Day. That's it. That's what he has accomplished in 20 years as a legislator. Now, that's not a record of accomplishment. I will do a better job than Mr. Vitality because I am a consensus builder. I am able to work with people. I am able to get things done. I'm a problem solver. I'm the kind of guy who can get things done when other people can't. I've proven it in my job, in my work with the sewer authority, and in my work with the soccer club. We need a representative who's, who's going to vote in a way that our voice gets heard in Harrisburg. We don't have it now. We will when I get elected. Thank you. Thanks for coming out on school night. Uh, I've been uh, told to remind you, please, uh, no applause. I know that might be difficult, but uh, we've got a limited time. I'm trying to combine some questions here and uh, hit as many topics as possible. First question uh, to Mr. Vidal, is that correct? Is that, is that who's going to Mr. Toll. Mr. Toll, do you believe that competition in education produces better results for our children? Do parents get to decide where their tax dollars are spent? If not, why not? If so, why? Well, I think 
I, I think that competition is generally a good tool for producing better results in general in most topics. However, I am a big proponent of public education. To me, states should be spending money on public education in good times and in bad times. It's the means by which most people get the most out of their time in school. It's the kind of thing that, that uh, I've been a big supporter of, continue to be a big supporter of, and uh, when it comes to the other types of ways in which public education, or not public education, education is provided, I do think there's a place for private, parochial, and, and other uh, education uh, providers. Uh, in, in our district, I think that uh, we are blessed, really, with the choices and options that we have, whether it's public education, private education, or parochial uh, schools. And not every community is so fortunate. So in other communities where they don't have those kinds of, of uh, opportunities, you have to have some other kind of uh, vehicle there, and that would be the place where you, whether it, was, whether it would be charters or vouchers or whatever, whatever. Uh, you have to provide something for people who don't have the kinds of options that we do. But when it comes to education, you know, I, I think that public education is where the state's money really ought to be going. Although I do believe that there are programs out there, whether it's the EITC, the uh, Education Improvement Tax Credit Program, or, or a similar program that allows a marriage essentially between education providers and business so that the business gets the tax credit and the education provider gets the resources, be it scholarship or other monies to go towards their uh, towards their programs. So I think that, yes, there is a place for competition among education providers, but that the state's resources really ought to be going to public education first, but there are programs that allow for monies to be used in these other capacities. My, my belief is that public education should be the, the primary and uh, priority for the state and that frankly the state could do more in terms of public education. I apologize to Mr. Tyler. There's multiple questions that are trying to wrap into one. It dials down a little bit into SB1. So just oh, this uh, this parliamentary really yes, had a question. Yeah he's got the same question but within the context of SB1 I'm just paraphrasing you would Supported in only certain places, not across the board. Is that correct? I'm sorry, you're asking me. SB1, would you support that only in certain places, not across the common? That's the voucher bill. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think that a, a voucher and a charter school, basically, when, when you have that sort of program, that is taking money directly from the school district's budget. And I don't think that's a good policy for a statewide implementation. I do think there is a place for it, but I don't think it is a good one-size-fits-all program. I think that where you have an objectively failing school district, that's a good program. I don't think it's a good program uh, as a statewide policy. I don't think it's good for our district. I would not support it if it was something that was going to apply either across the board or to our, uh, our, our area. Before I get to that, I just want to point out on the issue of being the only person to vote on an issue. I was the only person to vote against in Delaware County against that legislative pay rate. Sometimes it takes guts to do the right thing. But that you know, had nothing to do with the question before. On the, uh, on the issue of competition in school. Yeah, I would just ask you, would just answer the question. On the issue of competition in schools, um, I believe that the role of state government is to provide one public school system uh, to make it as good as we can with our limited resources, to make it open to all comers. Um, I think that uh, I voted against the EITC. I voted against, uh, would vote against, and have voted against uh, school vouchers. I think it's vouchers are an inappropriate use of tax dollars because primarily uh, it's using tax dollars in many cases to further religious beliefs. Uh, but the voucher program uh, in Senate Bill 1 would cost in year 3 $1.3 billion. Now we're cutting, as we did uh, two budgets ago, $900 million from basic education. How could we possibly fund Senate Bill 1, which would, which would take from somewhere $1.3 billion? Uh, the EI, uh, EITC diverted $150 million from our budget this year. Uh, again, when we're cutting schools, we're cutting programs, we're increasing classroom sizes. Not the appropriate, uh, not the appropriate thing to do. Regarding the EITC, there's no accountability with regard to where those funds go. 
There's no accountability with regard to the standards met as far as uh, educational standards in those schools who get the money. Uh, Mr. Vitale, what do you consider the role of a politician as it relates to job creation? Do you believe the government creates jobs or does the private sector create them when given the proper framework and freedom to do so? I think there's a role for both. I think you know, the government sets up the framework with uh, smart tax policies, uh, uh, with, with programs that uh, create jobs. In the area of uh, environmental protection, we, we create a lot of good green jobs with the, for example, the govern governor's energy independence strategy we, uh, we, uh, we enacted. You, you, when you see solar panels going up on roofs, there are people in factories who are working to assemble those panels. There are people who are installing them on roofs. There are engineers designing them. Uh, there is a role of government uh, and, 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 and also tax policy that uh, encourages it. But I think primarily the government's role is to set the framework. One of the problems with uh, those education cuts we uh, took two budget cycles ago, uh, about 14,000 public school employees were laid off as a result of those cuts. If you look underneath our unemployment figures, you see a lot of loss is in the public sector. So I think that there is a top, we can affect jobs, we can, we can affect jobs by the tight budgets we pass. So we have to make correct choices. So in short, I think it's uh, government has a role, the private sector has a role. Uh, I believe that mostly, if you're going to create jobs, it's going to be in the private sector. And the government has to basically allow the private sector to have the opportunity to create the jobs that it is capable of doing. When you create government jobs, basically you are, you're creating places that your taxpayers are, are paying for. Those are not the kind of jobs that, that most people are looking to create uh, when we talk about job creation. What we need to do is basically make sure that your tax policy is not chasing people out of the state. If you see a tax that is not competitive with your surrounding state's taxes and you don't reduce it, then you are foregoing the opportunity to uh, have that business in your community. A good example of that was a, a bill that I believe was a bill, House Bill, I think it was uh, 1100 this year, had to do with airplane, airplane parts and repair. And Mr. Baikali is one of, I believe, four, uh, may have been a few more than that, not many more than four or so people to vote against it. And what, what that deal had to do with was there was concern that Pennsylvania's tax was higher than surrounding states. And by lowering that tax, Pennsylvania was actually going to have the opportunity to get more revenue, to have more jobs, to have more effect, positive effect on the, on the economies in our state. But by having a tax at a higher rate, those jobs and those opportunities and that business was going elsewhere. Think about it. They air, what more mobile and uh, uh, able to get out of Pennsylvania uh, type of job could there be than, than an airplane? So people were consummating the deal in Pennsylvania, taking it to other states in order to uh, do, the, do the deal, and then coming back. Those were jobs in other places, whether it was uh, hangers, uh, parts, repair, labor, things that weren't getting done in Pennsylvania. The government, whether it's through taxes or through regulations or other programs, has to be competitive with our surrounding states in terms of the way that we approach it. Yet, yeah, you need to fund government. You need to fund all the sorts of things that, that programs and, and education and things that, that people expect and that we ought to. But you have to be able to do so in a proper context. Vote to repeal requirements for voter ID, voter photo ID. I vote to repeal it. Um, it's the voter ID law is not a well tailored law. I mean, it, it, you'd be foolish to say that there's no fraud in Pennsylvania, but the kind of fraud that this law was was really uh, designed to, it, is not really where where the problem is. So, would I vote to repeal it? Um, I don't know that I would vote to repeal it, but I would say that there, there are other things that we could do. If we're really serious about fraud, there are other things that, in other places that need to be addressed. You have fraud, and, and it wasn't that long ago in Philadelphia where a guy actually got a 
collected and was put in the house, and then they determined after the fact that there was fraud in, in terms of registration and absentee ballots. Those are areas where we have more fraud. And those are areas where the big, where if you really want to go after fraud in terms of election, that's where it ought to be. The voter ID law, I think, is not it's, it's not a well tailored law. It's not a well uh, detailed law in terms of the problem that it, that's supposed to be addressed. But I vote to repeal it. I don't know that I vote to repeal it, but I think if we're really serious about fraud, there are other things that we should be doing besides that. The, the problem with this law is, is as much the way that went, they went about it. The, the things that were said about it uh, were just not smart. I mean, this should not have been about voter suppression or anything along those lines. This should be about voter fraud. And if they were serious about it, it, it could have been delayed. What the, what the court ended up doing was actually not a bad thing. Uh, if you're serious about voter fraud and you're serious about doing the kinds of things to prevent it, then implementing it two years from now is not that big a deal. And it's, not that, it's not a bad idea. It's the, it's the kind of thing that, that if you're serious about fraud, though, there are other measures that you could be able to take. So I would, I would think that rather than repealing it, it's the kind of bill that ought to be uh, either uh, added to, amended, or uh, changed in a way so that where, the, where there is fraud and documented fraud, uh, it's the kind of thing that we ought to be looking at and, and pursuing in a, a, a better way than what this bill actually is uh, designed to do and is intended to do and has not yet been implemented to do. It's an absolutely terrible law. I would unequivocally appeal it. Uh, the uh, County Commissioners Association, a very conservative group, they have called this law a, a solution in search of a problem. They have said there is no evidence of fraud that justifies this expenditure of tax dollars estimated up to as much as $11 million. I had my staff research this issue and we looked at four different election cycles where 20 million votes were cast. And we called the Sentencing Commission and we said, how many convictions were there in that time period for people who attempted to go to polls and misrepresent their identity, the type thing that the ID would pick up? Five out of two 20 million people. Five out of 20 million people. This is worse than a waste of money. This is a cynical attempt to suppress the vote of poor people, of college students, of elderly people. And it's, it's not only in Pennsylvania. This is ALEC-driven legislation. It's designed to influence this presidential race. It's, it's in, in my view, everything that's wrong about politics. And I would unequivocally uh, repeal this at the earliest possible moment. I think when I look back on my career, I think uh, Haverford State will be my one of my proudest local accomplishments. I've been working on this for many years, longer than maybe some of you have been involved in Haverford Chapter. I see Jan smile because she was working right with me. I think one of the first things we did was we we uh, were able to transfer this property from the state to the township. Senator Williams and myself worked on that, but I, as an attorney, I insisted that that deed of transfer contain a provision that prevented that 125 acres from being uh, used for uh, anything other than open space. I think as the project moved along, what we tried to do was fight to shrink the development footprint. I remember very specifically being in, in a meeting in Senator Williams' office where they had a development plan of 60 acres, and I thought that was shocking, and it was, and we, and I made it clear, and everyone else in the room had signed off on that, but I made it clear that was too much. Uh, I asked Todd Polley to go back to his original plan, which was a better plan, and we eventually did get it shrunk, not as much as we should, should have gotten it shrunk. The rec center, what I tried to do, and then Tim Denny's the star of this, I don't know if he's here, but he's the star of this, but we worked very closely to get that rec center there. We kept trying to sweeten the pot. We first got a half million dollars from the uh, capital budget money uh, to sort of uh, make it easier for the commissioners. Then we got another half million. They got Dale and Leach to kick in some money. We got it to the point where they did the rec center. Not exactly the way I would have liked it. I think the, uh, they should have had a leisure pool. Uh, they should have even used less, less uh, development. But I think that, uh, as I look back, uh, that is a 
that's that's a really nice thing for the community, uh, and, and uh, I'm glad to have been part of it. My recollection is that Senator Tillman was actually the one who was the primary mover and shaker when it came to getting much of what was done after the reserve process. Uh, now, Mr. Vitale does get credit for bringing money for the reserve, I, I mean, for the rec center. I give him credit for that. $500,000 went a long way towards addressing something with that, that, the, that the community needed. However, when you think about it, that $500,000 is really a drop in the bucket compared to what Mr. Vitale could have been bringing back for 20 years. For the first 10 years of his term in office, time in office, Mr. Vitale made a point of saying that he's against uh, legislative initiative money, which he derisively refers to as WANs, and instead of bringing any money back, we brought zero money back. So that if you average out what he brought back in, in terms of the recreation center over 20 years, it really isn't that much. But he does get credit for that, and I give him credit for that, because I think that was a good thing for him to do. The reserve, uh, as I say, was really the product of a lot of work, and not just Mr. Vitale. And, and Senator Tillman, the omission of Senator Tillman, I think, was purposeful and, and not uh, appropriate. Now, Mr. Vitale takes credit for things that uh, Mr. Leach has done and things that others have done, but uh, he does get credit for that $500,000. But when you think about it, if that's what he's done in 20 years, that is not a great sum. We pay more in his salary and benefits and uh, over 20 years than he's, than he's brought back during that period of time. So we're actually still at a negative when it comes to the resources that Mr. Vitali has brought back to the community in the time that he has been in office. I give him credit for the things that, that, that did. He did a good job, and, and, and we should be appreciative of his bringing monies back for that. But let's keep this in perspective. The job that he did with that is, is, is really what he should be doing, but it's what he should have been doing for 20 years, not for the last two years. In 20 years, for the first 10 years, nothing. For the last few years, good job. What is your position regarding fracking and drilling on state college campuses and other public educational lands? Uh, well, the, the, the idea of, of fracking or drilling on, on college uh, and, and state-owned lands, I think, is something that should be explored. I think it's something that provides the opportunity for uh, income, revenue, uh, reduction in tuition, and uh, opportunities to enhance the, the resources that are at the state uh, level and, and for the communities in which these projects are taking place. Now, having said that, you can't do it uh, everywhere and it has to be done under circumstances that are going to keep uh, the, the individuals on campus and in those communities safe and that whatever you're going to do in, in any of these colleges is going to have to be well regulated and well supervised and it's not something that should be done on every inch of, of, of land. But there are plenty of states and plenty of communities where this is done and it's, it's, it's proven to be a resource and the kind of thing which ought to be at least explored. I'm not saying it's something you do at every campus on every, uh, every available kind of, of uh, uh, place where it, it could be done, but I am saying it's something that's worth exploring and worth looking into as a source of both income and uh, resources that are state resources and lands that ought to at least be uh, reviewed and looked at for the possibility of, of, of development. Anything you're going to do has to be done safely, it has to be done under the kind of regulation that uh, is, is in place and, and should be uh, furthered so that there are not the kinds of concerns that you might have with regard to uh, health, drinking water, or other kinds of, of, of concerns. But if those regulations and those supervisory um, uh, challenges are met, then it's something that ought to at least be uh, explored, if not uh, pursued. I, I think it's an absolutely terrible idea. I voted uh, and, and argued strenuously against Senate Bill 367. Uh, I've been up to Marcellus country. I've been climbed on many drill rigs. It's a highly industrial activity. There's lots of noise, there's roads, there's huge dirty retention basins, there's enormous truck traffic, there's 24 hour uh, a day work, there's flaring at night, there's spills, there's accidents. Uh, I can't think of anything more incompatible with the college experience. Uh, drilling on, on the, the Pashi land is just wrong headed. The problem is we put these schools in a position where they would accept something like that 
because we cut their budgets. We won't drill, we won't impose upon these drillers a severance tax, we, a fair severance tax like most every major other state has, and fund, and fund higher education the way it should be, but then we will put this, this highly industrial activity where students should have, have solitude, where professors should have classrooms that aren't noisy. If you're, if you're a parent, you don't want to send your, and you send your kid to Lock Haven or Mansfield, you don't want them to, you go, you send them there because of the tranquil atmosphere. You don't send them there uh, to be caught up in, 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 in a drilling site. It's just the wrong, it's just the wrong way to go. Uh, I'm, I'm not against all drilling. There is a place for it, but on, on, on college lands, on state forest lands, uh, just the wrong way to go. Just the wrong way to go. You put it in the right place, and then you put the appropriate safeguards. But college campuses, what, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? <laughs> Mr. Vitale, what can you propose in the state legislature to increase our property tax base in Haverford Township to reduce our property tax? <laughs> Mr. Vitale, what can you propose in the state legislature to increase our property tax base in Haverford Township or reduce our property taxes? Increased tax base. Uh, we are pretty much a built-out community uh, as far as increasing the tax base. Um, I have to give that one uh, some thought. The second part of the question was reduce our property taxes. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Uh, property taxes. Um, Frankly, that's not going to happen. It's simply not going to happen. Reducing property taxes is not going to happen, um, and and so I don't I don't really I don't really have an answer to that. I think you know we, we have to spend reasonably. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the most important thing we have is a good school system. So there's a price to be paid for that. We pay for it with our property taxes. Uh, they're not going to be decreased. Tax base is not going to be. Increased. Uh, there might be. I just have to give that. I just have to give that some thought. I'm not, not prepared to really talk about that tonight. Well, one, one of the things, if, if uh, well, there's two two parts to that. The first part, obviously, is, is encouraging the kind of uh, business development in our community that brings uh, people that want to be able to start up businesses and have success in some of the businesses and the vacant buildings in some of the places that we have within our township that are currently not producing tax revenues. And, and the kind of encouragement from business associations and, and the kind of, of uh, work to, to encourage people to come here is certainly a way to raise the tax base and get more revenue for the, the township, which would help in some respects with regard to the uh, property tax. The other thing is, if we change the way in which schools are funded to some extent and reduce the reliance on property tax and make it more something that would be uh, a, a, a combination of whether it's earned income or uh, Earn income or retail or uh, property tax, so that you're not relying solely on property tax. Then, then you have the ability to do that. There are some bills in the legislature that have not passed, but that are directed towards trying to uh, rework the way in which we fund public education. I, I think that's actually a good idea. I think the state needs to be more responsible for the funding of public education, but I don't think that burden necessarily has to fall entirely on uh, the, the homeowners and, and the taxpayers. The property of uh, property owners. Uh, when you look around our community, we are a bedroom community. So anything that, that will relieve property tax is going to affect pretty much everyone in our township and, and in a positive way. So I will work to try to, to accomplish that. Those are the kinds of things that I think that, that as a legislator you can have an effect on. Uh, and the effect is to, is to both change the way in which we fund public education, spread the burden down so it's not totally reliant on property tax, and, and then increase the property, or excuse me, increase the ability for folks to want to work and um, bring their business to Harper Township. So there you have it on both ends. You, have, you try to bring people into the area to fill the vacant uh, shops and stores, as well as reduce property tax. Come 
we've seen going on on TV is many publicly funded pensions across the uh, across the world are collapsing in Greece and in Europe. Uh, in some estimates, Philadelphia's uh, pension fund is funded at 20 percent. That means someday, or may well someday, the current version of the state whose pension fund is critically underfunded. So, what do you propose to deal with our pension crisis? And I believe that's to uh, Mr. Lazar. The um, pension crisis that um, we face deals with the series of the PEASERS, the uh, state employees and the uh, public school hiring system. Uh, we have a huge uh, amount of unfunded liability there. Um, uh, there's not enough in that fund to pay out claims. Uh, the reason for that is uh, multifold, uh, inadequate employer contributions over time, uh, poor economy, uh, increasing um, the benefits paid out. So that's the problem. Um, the solution is a little more difficult. Uh, we, we passed Act uh, 120 uh, uh, last year, and that dealt with future hires. It uh, increased the vesting period. It um, also uh, reduced benefits. Uh, and it also sort of smoothed out um, the payments that school districts would have to pay. Um, that's a partial solution. Uh, I've talked with educational experts uh, as to a further solution to that. And, and, and some of the smartest people in education and ed say, you know, there's not really a good answer. We're just going to have to tough it out. We're going to have to get through a tough time period. And uh, we're going to have to get, get through this. And there's, if, if there was a great solution, it would probably have been implemented, but there's not. But I think we just have to work our, our way through. So, well, first off, I don't think you can take away people's pensions or the deals that they made years ago when they made life decisions based on the, the, the deal that they thought they were getting when it came to uh, the jobs that they chose and the careers and paths that they sought. So, so I'm not, any solution I have is not looking to cut people's pensions or take people out of the programs that they already signed up for when they became teachers and public employees and, and some of these other things. But, but the system as it currently is, is, is unsustainable. You're going to have to have a different approach for people coming into the system. So you're going to have to have what amounts to almost a two-tiered system at some point. And toughing it out is, is not an answer. Toughing it out is just keeping your fingers crossed. That's not an answer. You have to do something affirmatively so that it's not going to be uh, necessarily the kind of tension that, that uh, people have that are currently in the system. But maybe they had a different pay scale. Or maybe they had the opportunity to have other uh, uh, benefits or other sorts of things that, that they will earn over the course of time. You have to do something to, to make it such that the system doesn't just go off the, off the cliff, and, that, and that's where we're headed. Pension reform is a big deal. It's something that has to be done for both the state system and the teacher side of it, and you're going to see some kind of either two-tiered system or a, a combination of things. But, you know, what I would do is, is make sure that the people who are already in the system are not hurt by any change that comes along. You have to do something. That's not the way to do it. You can't take away things that people have counted on and made lifetime and, and career decisions uh, when, when they took on these jobs and things. But when it comes to actually making tough decisions, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm expecting that that's going to be a difficult decision that has to be made. And, and most businesses have already gotten out of the dedicated pension business some time ago. The state is not. And, and there's no real good reason for that. This was a crisis that was a long time in coming. Everyone saw it coming. And people who have been in office for 20 years have done nothing about it to date. So this is something that if there was something that was going to be done, it probably could have been done by the people who are already in office, including uh, my time. We did that with Act 120. We did exactly what we said we should be doing with Act 120. Uh, the taxpayer may have to drill down a little bit. I'm sure the folks in Greece and the government there didn't think that they were going to default on their pension payments, but they find themselves with people throwing Molotov cocktails in the street. It's happening all throughout Europe, and our, our pension funds are critically underfunded. I guess my question is the answer. We can't, we got to tough it out. And the other answer, we're not going to cut anybody's benefits. Maybe we don't fly. Can we, can, I understand what I'm asking. Can you, can you tell me how you would deal with the other one? How do you see it rectifying? 
I, I think you ought to listen to the monitor. She's telling you you can't do that, Kevin. That's a follow-up question, sir. That's not the rules, Kevin. You need to follow the rules, Kevin. Yeah. Okay, my question is, how do you see the pension crisis? You need to answer another question. Okay. Can you repeat the question? I have two questions. Okay. One is, how do you see the pension crisis affecting the pension Pro-life and pro-choice, what do you believe the role of the government is as a state matter to protect the young woman? Is that correct? Uh, that is directed to uh, Bill. Pro-life or pro-choice, what do you believe the role of the government is to protect the young woman, state government? Well, at this point in our history, the United States Supreme Court has determined that abortion is, is constitutional. So what the state gets to do is, is limited in terms of the way that, that the state gets to address it. Um, you know, the state, I believe, has a, has a role, uh, but that role, role is, is really uh, found by the United States Supreme Court and, and their determination with regard to what is and is not constitutional on, on that topic. I am pro life. It's, it's one of the things that, uh, you know, it's not why I'm running, uh, but it's also, I also recognize that uh, you didn't have to look too far down the road, whether in Philadelphia, to see what happens where you had these uh, clinics that were not regulated. And Dr. Gosnell essentially killed women and children and did such a horrible job that, that uh, not only is he being prosecuted, but pretty much everyone in that office being prosecuted. So there is a role for government when it comes to uh, pursuing certain aspects of, of uh, pro, uh, well, the, the issue with regard to abortion. I don't believe it's something that the government should be funding. Uh, I do think it's something that there needs to be a, 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 an appropriate level of regulation and monitoring so that women are not put in jeopardy when they go to these kinds of places. Uh, it's, it's not something that I, uh, like I said, it's not why I'm running, but, but these are my views. And, it, and when it comes to the, the role of government, I, I would suggest that it's, it's the government's role is uh, really constrained in some ways by what the United States Supreme Court has uh, said on the subject. So in terms of, of the state, I don't believe the state should be funding it, but, uh, but at the same time, the state has to regulate and make sure that people are, that, that have these procedures are safe when they do so. And it's the kind of thing that, uh, unfortunately, we've seen uh, has not been the case. Uh, and as I say, you just have to look down uh, the Philadelphia to see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I'm pro-choice. I essentially agree with the holdings of Roe versus Wade. Uh, I do think uh, within certain parameters that it's the absolute choice of a woman to make that happen over her own body in consultation with her doctor getting good medical advice. Um, I support funding for Planned Parenthood. I think it's uh, uh, the decision as to whether you can or cannot get an abortion should not be determinative of your uh, income status. Uh, the bill, uh, the bill to bill, was referring to the ambulatory care bill that tried to put unneeded restrictions upon the board of abortion clinics had no basis in good medical practice, but was simply an attempt to put groups like Planned Parenthood uh, out of business. Uh, and uh, I oppose that legislation. Um, and I, I have, over the years, uh, seen many of my, several of my pro-life friends, uh, when they had a daughter impregnated by a disreputable character, turn from pro-life to pro-choice pretty quickly. In theory, I understand, but when it's real world, when your 16-year-old daughter, when she has a whole life ahead of her with her studies and her career and, and her college and all the things she wants out of life, and she's made a tragic mistake with a disreputable person, that's her choice, that's her life. And I think that it's, uh, uh, I've seen pro-life people turn pro-choice pretty quickly uh, under those circumstances. So I am, I am pro-life, I make uh, uh, no apologies about it. A pro-choice, I make no apologies about it.
if there's a way to raise this or not, raise the volume on this, so I'll just try to speak a little louder. Representative Vitale, what is your opinion on term limits? As a challenger in 1992, standing very little chance of winning, I did not support term limits. Uh, many good government groups, such as Common Cause and others, don't support term limits. Um, the, the problem with term limits is it forces you to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, we do have term limits, and they're two years. And uh, it's for the voters to decide who they want to choose to represent them. Um, yeah, it's been suggested uh, six, two, three two-year terms. If that were implemented, the Speaker of the House would start his career as Speaker presiding over the House with four years of experience under the belt. That's crazy. That's crazy. If you have term limits, you'll lose the instant, especially shorter term limits, you'll lose the institutional memory. You weaken the legislature relative to the governor. You weaken the legislature relative to staff. You weaken the legislature relative to lobbyists. Term limits is one of those ideas that sound good, have the populist feel to it. Um, but I think um, on further thought, it has problems. I would say if there were term limits, they ought to be lengthy so that you would not you would not lose the experience. You wouldn't want your doctor who's, who's uh, operating on your eye or your brain to be term limited out because he served uh, six years and it's time to move along. Uh, so it's, it's, I think there's a value to skill and experience and uh, I think the voters should decide when it's time. C comparing your legislator to your doctor I think is a bit of a stretch, but uh, I, I would suggest that term limits is a reasonable approach to addressing the kinds of concerns that, that people have about uh, the kinds of legislature and the kinds of representation that we've had for some time both in Harrisburg and in, in Washington, frankly. Uh, regardless of, of how we've gotten there, there aren't that many incumbents that lose, where, whereby there aren't that many instances where uh, there is the kind of turnover and the kind of, of uh, new fresh ideas and, and uh, discussions that ought to be taking place. And whether you draw the line in the area where Mr. Vitale was suggesting uh, at the three or six years term, which I think is probably too short, but I would think something on the approach of 10 or 12 years is probably about what I think. Uh, at that point, I think that you've had individuals who've been in the legislature for quite some time. And in term limits, I think, would be effective to say we don't have what amount to career politicians. And career politicians are people who go to office and then stay there. They don't have other sources of income. They don't do other work. They're not responsive to the community in the way that, that other people would have. If, if you're there, either by a term limit or because of the, uh, you have essentially what amounts to like a part-time legislature or a part-time uh, job out of it, then you're there for the right reasons. You're there to get something accomplished, to do something for your community, and then you're on to something else because that's the, that's the nature of the, of the job and, and the uh, timeline. We, we, we certainly have it for presidents. We have it for other elected officials. There's no reason why not to have it in the legislature. Uh, I would agree that it can't be too short where you are going to lose a certain amount of, of uh, institutional memory and, and, and some of the resources. That, but there's no reason not to. When you look at both Harrisburg and Washington and see the number of incumbents that win every time out and the little change that actually occurs, this would be a way to instill the new blood, the new interest, the new opportunity for other voices and other people to be heard. It's not a bad idea. Mr. Toll, if elected, would you Representative Vitale's case re-elected, can you work in a bipartisan way? And if so, can you give some examples in the past where you have worked in a bipartisan atmosphere? Is that too first? Okay. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I work in a bipartisan way in pretty much everything that I've, I've uh, been involved in. Uh, with the sewer authority, I'm the solicitor. Uh, we, have, we don't have Republican problems or Democratic problems, we have sewer problems. And in addressing these sewer problems, we, we, we try to deal with local officials, Republicans and Democrats and, and uh, whoever. And an example of 
my bipartisan effort has been trying to address the problem that we had at Mary Place down along with uh, Glendale Road, uh, Darby Creek there. And in, in that capacity, um, we've, we've gone to both the zoning board, the, the uh, commissioners, and now the DEP to try to get something done to do it. I actually went to Mr. Vitale's office, well, on someone on my behalf, and invited him to try to help because we thought in his, with his environmental background he would be somebody that would be uh, useful to, to, to have involved in this. He basically was unable to get much done in that regard, but we did reach out to him and make that, that effort. After that, I worked specifically with all the commissioners in Hacker Township to try to put together a plan to get through the board's approval so that we could do something in married ways. And I did it. Uh, I worked with all the Republicans and all the Democrats. The Democrats, to their credit, recognized that what I was proposing was not a Republican plan or a Democratic plan. It was a plan to fix a problem. So to Larry Holmes and uh, Mr. Siegel, I give credit for, for their willingness to work with me and, and, and go about working on something that was specifically a bipartisan effort to try to get something done with regard to a problem. In, in, in other capacities, uh, what, you know, when, I'm, when I'm working on other issues, whether it's in, uh, in my job as an attorney or in my job uh, soccer club or in none of these other capacities, I almost never know what people's parties are. I'm doing the job to accomplish a result that's for the good of the community, that's for the good of the people who are involved, and bipartisan is, is pretty much the way I operate. Every uh, session Tuesday in my office at 8.30, I have what I call my breakfast club, where we gather people from both sides of the aisle, Democrat and Republican, and talk about what's going to happen. Uh, one of the regular attendees is Kate Harper, a Republican representative from Montgomery County. Uh, we work together, in fact, on the House floor this, this past week. Uh, she re moved to revert to a prior printer's number on an important piece of bill to make it better. I got an IR meeting in support of her. We prevailed. We carry the day. Bipartisanship is very important, and I and I try to do that at the state level. It's it's uh, it's really policies that are important. Uh, I work very closely with Senator Erickson on the alternative energy portfolio standard uh, legislation. Um, I, I think that I I try to do that locally. Um, people like Bill Wexler, Mario Severo, they, uh, they they acknowledge our, the friendship. We have and the way we work together, or, or my office works together uh, with them. Uh, I try to work. Uh, I try to work closely with them. Uh, Bill, I thought it was a cheap shot with regard to the sewer authority. I uh, did attend the meeting. I did attempt to set a follow-up meeting with all other legislators from Delaware County. I did exactly what I was asked. The fact that they were not come to a meeting, they weren't exhibiting that spirit of our bipartisanship. But I did what I was asked. I came to the meeting, I listened, I tried to set up a follow-up meeting. So you suggest in that instance that I did not act in a, in a bipartisan way or try. That's just, just wrong and, it's, mis and, and, and uh, it's not showing gratitude for my trying to be helpful to your request. Um, uh, corporations were less likely to evade taxes. I think if you enacted combined reporting, you could lower the CNI, the corporate net income tax, from 9.9%. Uh, lower, uh, I would probably end the vendor discount uh, with regard to sales tax collection in this age of, of computer accounting. It's an unnecessary uh, break. Um, I think there's many things you can do. Uh, uh, I would, um, with regard to the, uh, um, we talked about um, funding roads and bridges, uh, the, lifting the cap on the uh, oil company franchise tax would be something I would recommend, help pay for roads and bridges. Uh, I think good infrastructure helps uh, business. Um, there are, uh, yeah, so I think they, these are some of the things I think I would do. Um, yeah. Uh, it's interesting you just mentioned Kate uh, Harper. I spoke to her yesterday and she pointed out that you were the one, one of the fellows who voted against the Act 13 bill that was the one that was going to actually provide uh, tax money and provide funds for such things as growing greener 
and uh, that uh, despite a lot of the things that, that you just mentioned, uh, that was one of the bills that you voted against. Uh, when it comes to funding uh, roads and, and infrastructure and things like that, yeah, we, there's a lot we can do. And whether it's a public-private part, public -private partnership, uh, whether it's reducing certain taxes like the one I mentioned earlier that Mr. Vitale voted against with regard to repair of airplane parts and, and things like that, to make us more competitive with our surrounding states, yeah, there's a lot that we can do with regard to our tax program. Our tax program has to be such that we're not chasing businesses away and making it more difficult for people to do what they want to do and, and, and do it in Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Vitale's programs in terms of taxing uh, drillers, uh, you know, that, that, that sounds good, but guess what? Uh, you have to be competitive and you have to be able to uh, make sure that you're not driving away the very business that you're, you're planning on, on taxing. Uh, what, what, what we're receiving now in, in Pennsylvania, in this area, is, is the result of people who didn't vote the way Mr. Vitale voted when it came to the gas uh, conversion in, in the refineries. Uh, just think about it. What kind of job losses we would have had if Mr. Vitale would have had his way when it comes to uh, refineries and, and trainer and Marcus Hook and, and Southwest Philadelphia. So there's a lot we can do with taxes, but you can't basically kill the golden goose when it comes to the people that you're, you're talking about taxing. Uh, public part of partnerships, or uh, partnerships, yeah, that's a good way to go, because everyone's got skin in the game in that instance. Builders, uh, labor, uh, governments, and things get done on time when everyone has those kinds of requirements. So yeah, there's a lot you can do with regard to taxes. There's a lot you can do to make it a more business-friendly uh, state and environment, and that's actually one of the things that I plan to do as a legislator, is to work to make this a more business-friendly place. If you have more people working, then you're going to have more revenue, and that's how you're going to help with the tax problem that you're currently talking about. Stop. Uh, Mr. Vitale, Pennsylvania leads the nation in a number of teacher strikes. What have you done to ban those strikes that, that hold the taxpayers and the students' lawsuits to union demand? By the way, that air, airport bill is a boondoggle to benefit one particular legislator's district. I'll get more research on that, but it was not a good bill. Uh, teachers' strikes. Um, frankly, uh, right now we have in place a framework uh, that I think is a balance between the right of teachers to go out on strike and to um, get a fair wage and on the other hand, the right of students to get a full 180-day school year. It's a framework that's set up that allows teachers to uh, uh, go out uh, a certain number of days, not compromising that 180-day school year. Uh, I, would not, I would not change current law on that. I absolutely would not uh, ban teacher strikes because that puts them in a position where they would not be able to uh, bargain fairly. I remember uh, as, a, as a young man how underpaid teachers were, so I would not ban teacher strikes. Um, so I honestly, I think the current framework that uh, is in place is not something, um, not something I've changed. Well, I, I think that we probably should move towards a, a program where teachers are not allowed to, to strike. I, I think that uh, we're in a situation where you have a situation where education is one of the primary ways that anyone is going to get ahead in, in this world. And, and public education is the vehicle by which that occurs. And for public teachers to be striking under the circumstances uh, that we currently have, I think is unacceptable. And while I, I don't think you, you have to necessarily uh, take away a teacher's ability to have some kind of a job action, a strike that we're talking about is not the way to go. It jeopardizes our children and it puts our community at risk. You don't see you, teachers, or, excuse me, police aren't allowed to strike, firemen aren't supposed to strike, prosecutors aren't supposed to strike. Why should teachers be in a position to strike? I mean, you're, you're, you're there uh, for the, you are one of the, the pillars of the community and you're there for a purpose. Now, we need to pay teachers a, a, uh, an appropriate salary. And as I said before, pension needs to be reformed. Uh, but that's another area that, that we need to address when it comes to dealing equitably with the constraints that school districts have, taxpayers have, and people who put their kids in schools have when it comes to dealing with uh, the education system in this, in this state. So to say that you wouldn't do anything, I think, is, is really not a step in, in the right direction. I think we do need to do something about it. Um, I'm not sure that you take away all the opportunity to 
that's some kind of a job action. But uh, strike at this point, I think, is, is counterproductive, and you, you end up with bad feelings. You don't necessarily improve the, the lot of the teachers or the students. And in fact, what you end up doing is hurting your entire community in the process. Thank you very much to both the candidates and to our moderators. Because of time, we're not going to get to hear any more questions, but I'd like to allow each candidate five minutes or less to do their closing statements. So Mr. Vitale had the first word. Mr. Toll, you can go last and have the last word, or you can go next. It's up to you. Uh, And thanks to the league uh, for doing all the great work you do in putting this on. Thanks to the audience for the patience. Thanks to the people um, at home. Um, I'm asking the community to return me to the legislature uh, for the next two years. Um, and I think when you're dealing I think when you're dealing with an incumbent, the question really is, has he done a good job? And I think that's what you have to, and if you're, the incumbent has a good job, then I would suggest the proper what, the thing to do is to set him back. Um, has my district office helped you? When, they, when you come to them for help, have they helped you? I would, I would suggest to you that my office has one of the best staffs in this state. We have a great reputation. We've been helping people for many years. Have I kept you informed? My newsletters, my cable shows, my emails. Do you know what's happening in state government? I think I've done my job in trying to keep you informed. Have I been an advocate for this district? When this district uh, was uh, attempted to be redistricted by the reapportionment commission on this very stage, we had a meeting to try to organize. Eric Ring, who's in the audience, uh, we enlisted him to try to fight that redistricting. Haverford State, we really tried to make that better. I'd like to think that I have been an advocate for this community. Have I been independent? You need an independent legislator in Harrisburg. I've been in the legislature for 20 years, and I've never accepted a dime from a special interest group. Never one time. I've never accepted gifts from lobbyists. Uh, and I think uh, I'm not afraid to go against my own party. I won't be bullied. I'm not afraid to stand alone. You know what? I think the ability to stand alone is something you want in a leader, not something you, you criticize in a leader. I mentioned before uh, the pay raise vote, that infamous pay raise vote. It was hard to stand up and, and, and be the only no vote in Delaware County. But it was the wrong vote. We were getting a lot of pressure from our leadership. It was just the wrong vote. I think I have that strength. I think I have that strength when it's bad public policy. I don't go along with everybody else. I don't go along with leadership once. I don't go along with lobbyists. And I'll continue to do that. Do I work hard? I've been in Harrisburg 20 years. That's a lot of session days. Every time we have been in session for those 20 years, I have been in Harrisburg every single day for 20 years. I work seven days a week. A lot of your interactions with me have been on a weekend, they've been on a, on a Sunday or a Saturday. I work as hard, I work as hard as I can. I think that's, that's the hallmark of someone who's, good, who's done a good job. I still have the passion for this job. I feel incredibly lucky to have it. I feel like I have a mission. I feel like there are too few voices in Harrisburg who fight for environmental protection, uh, who fight against the special interest group, who fight for education. I feel I play a valuable role in Harrisburg. What I would ask you, especially the audience out there, because I think a lot of us in the room may have been aligned with one party or the other, make your decision, not on the information I give you about Bill, and especially not about the information Bill gives you about me. You need to get your information from objective sources, personal dealings with me, what you've read in the paper, what you know about from trusted friends. Don't get your, don't get your information from campaign literature. I've already gotten two negative pieces. 
sponsored by the House Republican Campaign Committee. Bill signed his name to him. He's responsible for that garbage. Um, but don't, don't take your information from them. You're going to get a, a number more, get at least two or three or before this is over. I suspect it's going to get worse. Don't take your information from that. Ask yourself, based on your own feelings, do you feel I've done a good job? If you feel I've done, done a good job, I'll ask you on November 6th to give, give uh, uh, me your support. Thank you. We need a representative in Harrisburg who's going to vote the way that our community is voted, given the opportunity to do so. We don't have one right now. I will be that guy. I've lived in Hanford Township my entire life. I grew up in Westgate, graduated from Harrisburg High School, Gettysburg College, Dickinson Law School, married my high school sweetheart. Uh, we now live in the paddock section across the street from my in laws. My, uh, my children are third generation to go to Harrisburg High, Harvard, uh, high School and go through the public school system. There are scholarships in my family's name. We've been involved in education in this community for generations. My son is, is in 10th grade. My daughter graduated from uh, Hafford and then from Susquehanna. Uh, I've, I've chosen to live and work in this community and to do things that I think are important in all sorts of different areas of, of our community. Uh, I've, I've lived and worked in this area and made it where I want to raise my family. I've been active in things such as keeping our community safe, such as working to protect our environment, and such as providing recreation opportunities for our children. And, and I've been, and, and these are things that, that, that matter to people. When you look at where I've been and what I've done, I, I've been in the DA's office for 25 years. I've handled some of the most significant cases in our community's history. The DuPont case involving the murder of Olympic wrestler Dave Schultz. The case involving Arthur Bomar and the murder of Amy Willard whose parents are friends of mine. As with the RHM, I've been the solicitor for, for years. We've worked with, with Republicans and Democrats, and, and I have reached out to try to get Democrats to help on different things. And, and, and I've pointed out the fellows who, who actually have been helpful in that regard. Uh, I do work to get problems solved. I'm a consensus builder. I'm able to get things done. Uh, when it comes to the sewer authority, I've been there for a long time, and I'm still working there. I'm the guy that goes to the zoning hearing boards. I'm the guy that goes in front of the, the Board of Commissioners. I'm the guy that's working with DEP now. Our state representative hasn't been in that picture for years, hasn't come to any of these meetings, hasn't been involved. This is a health, safety, and environmental issue literally in our backyard at Murray's Place at, 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 on Long Glendale Road. And I, I don't know what to tell you. For years, I have worked with the school districts in Haverford and Radford. I'm the liaison. I'm the person that gets the phone call when something happens in the school district. I'm the guy who helps make the decision whether or not when something happens, whether it's a child or somebody who shouldn't be on the campus, whether it's something that has to be done as far as either law enforcement or whether it's something that can be handled with, with uh, school discipline. I deal with Mr. Kyle I deal with the solicitor, I deal with the school board. I deal with those folks every week both Radnor and in, and, and, and in uh, Harvard. I go to school, school board meetings. I can't remember the last time Mr. Bartali's been to a school board meeting. I go to the commissioner's meetings. I keep in touch with things at the schools. I can't remember the last time we've seen Mr. Bartali at any of those sorts of things. For years, I've been the DA who's been involved with the school district and in, in two school districts, Harvard and in, in Radnor. I've worked with the soccer club for, for years, first as a, well, first as a kid, but I was a player. Well, I was still a player, but. <laughs> I, my point is, I work there as a coach, as a player, as a parent. Uh, I'm still there. Uh, I've been on the board. I've been the president. I know how to deal with volunteers. When you're dealing with volunteers, you can't tell them what to do. You have to say, what do you want to do? What are you willing to do? And how can I help you? It's how you get things done. It's the same way as a legislator. You have to be able to work with people. You have to be able to deal with people who don't necessarily have any reason under the sun to deal with you. Mr. Vitale is a perfect example of what that means. He's, he's one of 203, and he's usually the one standing by himself on things that are important to him. They may be important to everyone else, too, but he doesn't have either the ability or the willingness to get things done that he thinks are important. What does that tell you? 
Mr. Spratelli has not had a single piece of legislation passed since 1993. And one of the two things that he got passed was the observation of a birthday in Pennsylvania. That's it. That's 20 years of experience. And the, first, the only two bills he got, the first two that he had uh, got done, and that was in 1993. You have to be able to get stuff done. How does anyone get anything done in any sort of group? You have to work with people, you have to compromise, you have to be able to cooperate. All things I do well, all things I would suggest Mr. Vitale doesn't do well. His record, and he's proud of it, as being the one guy who stands out on, on these things. These are bipartisan, overwhelmingly supported bills in our community and in the, in the House of Legislature. Now, yet, he gets credit for voting against the payers, but guess what? That's one thing he can take credit for for standing, and he didn't even stand alone. There were a lot of people that voted against him. 20 years. One bill passed that wasn't on a resolution. I will do a better job. It's time for a change. It's time for it's time to get something done. And it's time for our voice in Harrisburg to be heard. I look for your support. I look for your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have just the opportunity to see two fine candidates. Thank you all for coming out tonight to hear from our candidates. Special thanks to Bill Cole and Greg Vitale. Don't forget to tell your friends and neighbors to watch the podcast on the local cable channels, Facebook, and our home streaming service.